So we will be moving the counters over the map following the comprehensive example of play found in the rulebook. And we'll start right now. And we begin each round by dealing each of the players seven cards. Let's take a look at the British hand. I have an emissary card. This is the card that is used to sway a vassal state to your side, to your camp, if the vassal state is neutral, or to neutral status if it's on, in the opponent's camp. Spoiler, this is a card that is used, as the title says, to try to spoil that, um, that attempt, uh, the emissary card. So it lets you uh, transfer one of your officers to try to spoil the attempt. But if you lose uh, in the attempt, your officer will get eliminated. Rebellion, this is a card that is played on an opponent's vassal state that the opponent has conquered. And uh, there's a chance that a rebellion will spark, and then we'll have those rebel units in the game causing havoc to the opponent. Hero, this is a card that allows you to transfer one of your officers to any, sp any space within three uh, spaces from your capital in a combat situation. So this is a, re a reaction card. Campaign card can only be used for its value of four, either to conduct four moves or bring four strength points as reinforcements. Imperial commitments, this causes your opponent to transfer half of his strength points to their base. And shooting leave, this is a spy card. If you're successful, uh, you get to see the opponent's cards and take one from your opponent. If you're not successful, your spy gets killed. So that is the British hand. Let's take a look now at the Russian hand. They have two emissary cards, one Martini, Henry Rifles and Krupp Guns card. This card uh, uh, provides an enhanced effect during combat, but it is only playable in the 1870s, and in this example, we're in the 1830s, so it can only be used for its value of three in this turn. They have also a hero card, a campaign card, a gunboat diplomacy card. As we stated before, this card has to be played in order to move uh, through blue connection lines or retreat through them too. Persian persuasion. This card is played to uh, revert Persia to neutrality once Persia is in the opponent's camp. And there's four of them, so Persia is not a very trustworthy ally in game terms here. And we're back to our emissary card. So this is the Russian hand. So play starts with each player secretly choosing one card from his hand, placing it face down on the table or on the map, and then both players reveal both cards. The player with the card that has the lowest value will have the initiative and go first. So this uh, CDG is quite different than others in the sense that a card play is based on a face-off mechanism during each round of this procedure takes place and that determines who has the initiative. If both players play a card with the same value, a die is rolled and on an odd result, the Russians have the initiative and even result, the British have the initiative. So each of the sides select a card and let's take a look at what these cards are. The Russians played an emissary card with a value of one, and the Brits played a shooting leave card with a value of two. So the Russians have the initiative, and they will play their card first. And played cards are placed in this space here, Russian current card. And the British place their card in their corresponding space. So the Russians play their emissary card, 
and they can target an unconquered vassal state of at least three spaces. In this game, all vassal states have three spaces, except two of them. Kiva has two spaces, and Herat has one. And Persia definitely qualifies as one of the vassal states with three or more spaces. And now the Russians have to select one of their officers as an emissary and transfer him to the vassal state's capital. Now, uh, the Russians start the game already in Tehran with two of their officers, and they will select Simonich as their emissary. Now, if the Russians had no officers in Tehran, they could have just picked up one of their officers from wherever on the board and transfer him to Tehran, and that is a difference between marching. Uh, transfer can be conducted by officers in the when emissary cards are played and also when spoiler cards are played. Marching is what uh, strength points do, and uh, they have to march over the connecting lines that we saw before. So Simonich is selected, and the right-hand number, as we stated before, is the diplomacy score. Simonich has a diplomacy score of one. However, there's a special rule that emissaries sent to Tehran have a diplomatic score of three for uh, emissary card play. So Simonich's diplomacy score is an automatic three. And now the Brits have to decide if they're going to play a spoiler card or not. The British do have a spoiler card, but do they want to play it? Uh, that uh, diplomacy rating of three in Tehran means that the Russians only have to roll two or more to be successful. And if they are successful, whichever officer the Brits send over to spoil this attempt will be killed. So the Brits figured out it's not worth it to uh, endanger one of their officers uh, at this time. So now we roll 1d6 and we add the diplomacy rating of Simonich, which is three. The roll is a three modified to a six, which is higher than the five required. So now Persia becomes a British vassal state. And now Russia controls Persia and we place Russian control markers in each of the Persian spaces. And also the Russians can now place the uh, strength points of the Persian army which is 20 strength points and distribute them uh, anywhere in Persia and they will place them all in the Persian capital of Tehran. Now, uh, for all purposes and effects, the Russians control the Persian army. Now notice that the Russians played the text of the emissary card for its effect and they can still use the card's value of one to move any uh, units in one space uh, across a connection line to one other space. But as you know, even the movement of one space to another will cause an attrition check, and the Russians deem that it is not worth to undergo an attrition check just for the movement of one space. So they will pass on using the card's value. And we place the just played emissary card in the Russian current card space. Now we go to British round number one and they will play or have to play the shooting leave card. They can play it for value first and then for the text or for the text first and then for its value. They decide to play the text first so they will designate one of their officers as a spy. And the Brits select Stoddard, who is in Tehran, Persia. Now we have to check to see if the Russians want to play an informant card to try to foil this attempt, that is, if they have one. But the Russians don't have an informant card to play. So now the Brits will roll 1d6 and add the spy's diplomacy score. Stoddard's diplomacy score is a 1. And if the result is four or more, then the British can inspect the Russians' hand and take one of their cards for their own. And uh, 
if uh, that fails, if they don't roll four or more, then Stoddart is eliminated. So we roll 1d6, and the result is a 3 modified to a 4, just enough to succeed. So this uh, spying attempt is successful, and the Russians have to show their entire hand. So the Russians have a hero, the Martini Henry rifles, and Krupp guns card, which is not usable for its text in this turn, another emissary card, Persian persuasion, gunboat diplomacy that would allow the Russians to cross the Caspian Sea, and a campaign card. And now the British decide to take the gunboat diplomacy card to deprive the Russians of that movement across the Caspian Sea. So the British have played the shooting leave card for the text, and now they can play it also for the value of two, that is to move uh, units in two spaces, one space, or units in one space, two spaces, but the Brits decide not to move any units in order to prevent any attrition from decimating these units, so they will pass on using the card's value. And we place the card in the British current card space. Now we move on to round number two. Now each side selects the card and places it on the table. The Russians have played their second emissary card with a value of one, and the British play imperial commitments with a value of two, so the Russians have the initiative and will go first. And the Russians target Afghanistan for this emissary card, and now, the Russians select one of their officers to be transferred to the capital, Kabul. And they pick Vitkievich, who is in Tehran, so he'll be transferred to Kabul. And now the British decide if they will play their spoiler card. And they decide to play the spoiler card, so they place the card in the British reaction card space. Spoiler card allows them to immediately transfer one of their officers to uh, Kabul to contest the diplomacy role. And the British select Burns, who is in Delhi, and he is transferred to Kabul to contest the uh, diplomacy die roll. Now a die roll is made and uh, Vitkievich's diplomacy rating of two is added, but because the British are contesting with Burns, we subtract Burns' diplomacy rating, which is also two. So that cancels Bikievich's diplomacy uh, modifier. So it's going to be whatever comes out of a uh, roll of 1d6. And to be successful, uh, the Russians need five or more. If unsuccessful, then their diplomat or emissary, Bikievich, is eliminated. And the role is a four, not enough. So Vitkievich is eliminated. And Afghanistan remains as it was, that is, neutral. And the Russians can still play the value of the card to move uh, units in one space, one space, but they will decline to do so at this time. And we place the just played emissary card in the Russian current card space. The British now play their Imperial Commitments card and they will play it for reinforcements. That means that they can bring two strength points of reinforcements into the game. It can be the British units or those of an allied vassal state. They don't have any allied vassal state that has any uh, units in the game. So they will bring two strength points which are placed in their home base at Delhi. And every time uh, you play a reinforcement card, you also get to roll 1d6 to see if you can add one more strength point on account of vassal states that are under your control, but we won't even roll a die here because the British don't have any vassal states under their control. Uh, but if they would, you roll 1d6, and if the 
Di result is equal or less to the number of vassal states under your control, you get an extra strength point. And since the card that was played was played for reinforcement, uh, the text is not used, so we place the card now in the current card space for the British. And round two is over. Now we move on to round three. Each side selects a card. And let's see what those are. And each side selected a campaign card with a value of four. So we have to roll a die to see who has the initiative. It will be the Russians if it's an odd result, the Brits if it's even. And the die result is a one, so the Russians have the initiative and they will play their card first. Campaign cards have no game text, so you can only play them either to bring reinforcements into the game, in which case uh, it would be four strength points, or to conduct four moves. And the Russians will play the card to conduct moves. And the Russians will move Simonich together with the 20 Persian strength points to Khorasan as their first move. And the Russians still have three more moves. The second move, we'll see that same stack continuing into Herat, which is a neutral vassal state. And this move actually constitutes an invasion. Now Herat doesn't have any forces like Persia or Afghanistan, but because the Russians are invading Herat, now the British will control their forces, which are represented by the 15 strength points in Herat's fortress. And Herat is actually three spaces from Delhi, which is the British base. And the British play this card, Hero, which is a reaction card played out of sequence. And this card can be played if there's an attack that is three spaces, either land or sea spaces, away from the Imperial player's capital. The British Imperial player's capital is Delhi, and Herat is three spaces away. So the British can transfer any one of their officers to the space targeted for attack. And the British will transfer Pottinger, who is in Delhi, to Herat in order to affect the combat situation there. Here we have a summary of combat resolution, which is very simple in this game. Uh, in this game, each force rolls a number of dice determined by its composition. And the camp that has fewer dice to roll, rolls first, inflicts losses, and then the other side with uh, the forces that it has remaining rolls. Now, in this case, Imperial Strength Points roll one die and uh, first round Rebels. If you have Rebels in the space, in their first round they roll one die. Now, if you have Imperial Strength Points mixed with Vassal Strength Points, you would also roll one die. And if you have Vassal Strength Points with an Officer, you roll two dice. And that's the situation we have with both sides. The Russians have 20 Persian Strength Points with an officer, which is Simonich, and the British have uh, 15 strength points, that is the fortress's strength, with uh, a British officer, Pottinger. So they both roll 2d6. If you would have uh, vassal strength points without an officer, you roll 3d6. Now, in cases where both sides roll the same number of dice, uh, what we do is that both sides uh, resolve combat and losses are taken simultaneously. So how is combat resolved? You roll the indicated number of dice, and then you subtract the officer's tactical rating. And then that number, you compare it to the composition and strength points of the force, and if it is less than the number of strength points of the force, the uh, difference is the amount of losses the other side will have to take. So let's take a look at this combat situation. We have Simonich with 20 strength points, and 
he must roll two dice because it is a force composed of vassal strength points with an imperial power officer. So he rolls two dice, and the roll is a nine. We subtract one for Simonich's tactical value, and we get a final result of eight. There's 20 Persian strength points there, so 20 minus 8 is 12. So the uh, Russians uh, inflict 12 uh, points of damage on the fortress of Herat. And we placed damage markers totaling 12 points worth of fortress damage. So the fortress of Herat now has only a strength of three strength points, but this combat resolution in particular is simultaneous. So now it's the British turn to uh, fire back. The British roll a five and we subtract Pottinger's tactical value, that's three, to give us a total of two. So uh, 15 uh, minus two equals 13 points of the losses to the Persians. So that leaves the Persian force with seven strength points and since this was an attack on a fortress and the fortress still has strength points remaining, the Persians have to retreat. The, I must say, the Russian-led Persians have to fall back. And that ends the Russian move and now we have to roll for attrition. When rolling for attrition after a move, we, uh, after a march. When rolling for attrition after a march, we roll 2d6 and add a plus two modifier. And this is the number of strength points that are safe from attrition. So the Russians roll an 11 modified to a 13. So 13 strength points would be safe from attrition. And the uh, force only has seven. So all seven points are safe and no points are lost on account of attrition. And that ends the Russian round. Note that the campaign card um, gave the Russians four moves. They only conducted two moves, but they were forced to retreat. That means that they cannot continue with other uh, moves. So the Russians could, if they wanted, uh, move other units on the map. They still have two points, but that would entail, of course, um, attrition checks, so they will forego those two remaining points. And we place the campaign card in the current box. Now it's the British third round, and they play their campaign card, and they will use it for action, that is, to conduct marches. And the British use their first point to move all their 14 strength points they have in Delhi to Sindh. And this constitutes an invasion. Now, Sindh doesn't have any standing army or strength points. So there's no real consequence in terms of combat. So the British now spend their second point to move that same force into Kandahar. And this also constitutes an invasion. So now the Russians take control of the Afghan forces. So the Russians decide where to place the 10 strength points of Afghan forces that they will be able now to control. And the Russians place all 10 strength points in Kabul. Notice that no control markers are placed in uh, Afghanistan because Afghanistan is still neutral. It is just that the Russians will control the Afghan forces against the British there. So the British have two action points left. The third action point is to move their force from Kandahar to Ghazni. And this triggers combat with the fortress of Ghazni that has 10 strength points. Now we determine who rolls first. The British, whose force is composed entirely of imperial troops, will roll one die. 
and the uh, Afghans will roll three dice because these are vassal state forces with no imperial officers. Because the British roll less dice, they will roll first and inflict casualties on the Afghans, and then the surviving Afghans will roll. The British roll a three, and the British have a total of 14 strength points, so 14 minus three is 11 strength points that the fortress must lose. The fortress only has 10 strength points, so it is destroyed. That means that the Afghans don't fire back. The British have one more point uh, from their uh, campaign card to use, and they use it to move their force into Kabul, dropping off one strength point to maintain control of uh, the fortress of Ghazni, or the space of Ghazni. And this is done to prevent the Afghans from retreating into Ghazni. That's, this would force them to retreat outside of Afghanistan, in which case they would be eliminated. And the reason they would be eliminated if forced to retreat is because they would have to retreat into Bokhara, which is a space that the Afghans do not control. You can only re retreat into spaces that you control. And before continuing, since the British dropped off one strength point at Ghazni, we have to roll for attrition. And in this case, where it's just one strength point rolling for attrition, uh, you'll see that uh, it will always be protected from uh, the effects of attrition because you roll two dice and you're never going to get a result which is lower than two. So uh, that strength point is unaffected. So now we proceed to the battle. And the British roll first because they only roll one die compared to three dice that the Afghans will roll. The British roll a five, which is eight less than the 13 strength points they have. So they inflict uh, eight strength points of losses on the Afghans. Now the Afghans roll. And of course, any die result that they roll with three dice is going to be uh, greater than the amount of strength points they have. So just to give you an example here, they rolled a 12, so 12 is not less than 2, so they inflict no losses on the British. So now the Afghans lost the combat, and they don't have any adjacent uh, controlled space into which they can retreat. That's why the British left uh, one strength point in Ghazni. And because they have no controlled space they can retreat into, they are eliminated. And now we roll for the attrition of the British forces that are currently in Kabul. This is a regular attrition check done at the end of the march, so we roll 2d6 and add 2. The roll is a 7 modified to a 9, so 9 of the 13 strength points are safe. That means that the British lose 4 strength points to attrition. And we eliminate the strength points accordingly. Now, the British have conquered uh, Afghanistan, so we place British control markers there in each one of the spaces, as well as discontent markers, because this country came onto the British camp by way of invasion. And discontent markers is the way that the game has to identify those vassal states that were conquered, and uh, that allows a player later to be able to play this um, rebellion card to cause a rebellion in such vassal states. That's the end of round three. Now play would normally proceed to round four. So this is where the extended example of play ends and where we will end this video. I hope that this video has given you an idea of the flow of the game and what the game has to offer. This is Tuka Joe. Signing off for now, thanks for watching.